This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. Uh, in our recreation of Eric Sloan's studio, um, after he died in 1985, and it was rebuilt here on the museum campus as, as part of our building, and as a part of that studio included the author's library. And one of the coolest items, uh, one of his books is titled uh, American Barns and Covered Bridges. And this book felt different than, than the others. And uh, I opened it up and sure enough, it was a hollowed out book that inside he had placed all of his notes, his handwritten notes and news clippings and correspondence. This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast today. We're really excited to be talking with Andrew Rowand, who is the acting curator and site administrator at the Eric Sloan Museum. Um, and I profess to Andrew before we started the conversation that I am um, an unabashed Eric Sloan nerd and uh, fan and or groupie. Um, and so I'm super excited to be talking with him Um about this man and the work that they're doing to tell his story, but also sort of push the boundaries of the interpretation of this museum and, and who Eric Sloan was. But for people who aren't familiar, we'll be learning all about that. But before we get there, um, Andrew, uh, we'd love to know a little bit more about you. So how did you end up working at the Eric Sloan Museum? And I suppose what led you to the study of history and, and this line of work? Well, thanks for having me today, Nick. And um, that that's uh, probably a good way to start it out. I uh, have just always been a lover of history and volunteered at museums um, as a teenager um, and then decided that I wanted to make uh, history my profession by going to school uh, to be a history teacher. Um, but through those studies, realized that the, the classroom setting wasn't really for me and uh, came back to the love of museums. So I, I really wanted to bring um, education uh, into the public history setting um, and, and be involved in that that whole process. So um, I was really fortunate to have opportunities uh, working for the National Park Service, um, the Maryland Park Service, um, and found my way down to Richmond, Virginia a few years ago, where I worked on uh, at Henricus Historical Park, um, managing their 17th century farm. And there is when I really uh, was able to uh, develop my, my kind of love for early America and uh, had some experience with timber framing and barns, and I uh, used Eric Sloan's references and materials um, that I had known about um, for for that purpose, educating the public. Um, and I, my wife and I, always joked that it would be uh, kind of the dream job to get a position at the Eric Sloan Museum. It's one of those things you just talk about. And sure enough, one day uh, I saw the, the job posting and uh, went out on a limb and applied for it. And a couple months later, here I am. So uh, it was a, a really nice, nice coincidence, I guess. And you were a native of the state of West Virginia. Is that right? Yes, sir. I'm a native West Virginian. And I went to uh, school at Shepherd University there in the eastern panhandle. So uh, a region, is, as you know, is just so uh, full of history and um, it's just a wonderful place. Yeah. And I guess in the interest of full disclosure, I also went to, I'm also a shepherd grad, although we didn't know that until we set up the interview. So this was not a, some type of shepherd cabal, um, not, but not funded by shepherd. <laughs> no. Um, although they could be a sponsor if they'd like. Um, so, um, you know, we've been talking a little bit about Eric Sloan. You and I have been batting this name around and um, you said that it was, you know, the dream job to work there, but a lot of people listening, particularly perhaps people, you know, not here in the United States, may have no clue who Eric Sloan is. So why don't you give us the the sketch of who is this man and why is there a museum dedicated to him? So uh, that is a question we we ask ourselves every day here at the museum is, is who is Eric Sloan? Um, it's something that I think when that name is is brought up, people have a couple different avenues that, that they might not, that they might know Sloan from. Um, so I think probably he's most well known for his, his works, uh, his, his authorship um, and his artwork of early America, um, especially um, what would be considered quintessential early America, New England. And um, what a lot of people don't know though, is that he has all these other avenues of his life that he explored. He didn't um, get into uh, really studying history until later in his life. Um, it started out as an artist uh, painting uh, 
cloudscapes and early American aircraft uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and then he uh, also uh, was a traveling sign painter um, and went around the country just really developing his art. And on these travels, he finds uh, a connection to early America and decides that his calling will be to teach people about uh, the early American spirit um, or what he calls the early American spirit uh, through uh, several books um, that he's going to write. Um, so uh, I think when we look at Sloan, we, we try to boil it down into a couple categories to simplify it because you can take a turn and end up down hundreds of fascinating rabbit holes. So we, we define it as he's an author, he's an artist, uh, he's a collector, and one that he would pride himself on, he, he really pride himself on being an American. So Eric Sloan uh, is actually not his real name. It's an assumed name. And he was born Everard Hendricks uh, in 1905. And then sometime during his artistic career, he decides to change his name um, to separate himself from previous works. So he takes the name Sloan after the American painter uh, and his teacher, John Sloan. He adds an E at the end of that name. So that way he doesn't try to claim any relation. And then later he claims to take the name Eric uh, due to the fact that it makes up the word American. Um, how true that is, we're not sure, but that's the story Sloan tells. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it, so it's it's interesting. And he and we'll, we'll let's we'll talk about some of his writing and maybe some follow up questions here just to kind of give people a sense for the um, how much he did and just all, all the different things that he worked on. Um, he comes across to me and I, and I know you don't want to like mischaracterize or maybe characterize um, the, the man himself that you're, you know, you know, your job is to interpret him. He comes across sometimes as a curmudgeon too. Like, I don't know if you get that where it's sort of like, Oh, things used to be so good. And I mean, I think if you read it with a grain of salt and a little bit of humor associated with it, you can take it, but sometimes you're like, okay, all right, we get it. Like, do, do you, I mean, Eric Sloan, the man, like, obviously you would have loved, I'm guessing you would love to have actually met him, never had the chance, but it, do you get that sense too that there's a little bit of like a oh things used to be so good and now all these newfangled things are bad? There's a little of that coming through. Yeah, yeah, for sure, and that's something that we um, definitely try to acknowledge here at the museum. Is as he got older, um, his writing takes a little more of that um, sarcastic kind of cynical tone when he's looking at, at the culture today, um, and he he says that he actually created this museum um, and started collecting these tools as a direct uh, result of um, seeing a lot of pop art of the 1960s. And he wanted to show true American art. So he started collecting these tools. Um, and we definitely uh, have that feeling that he often over romanticizes the past. And he uh, isn't always telling the full story. Um, so that's something going ahead um, that we're, we're really looking at confronting and while still using a lot of uh, the, the good aspects of his uh, his writings and and um, sometimes his ramblings. <laughs> so, um, OK, some I guess these are kind of like rapid fire follow ups just to give people a sense for who he is and what, what he what he accomplished. Any sense for how many books he actually wrote? I, I'm always feel like I'm always surprised, like, oh, there's another Eric Sloan book I didn't know about. And like they're like reconstituted in different ways and republished and stuff. But like how many what's the what's the universe of Sloan Sloanology here? So uh, we we say 38 uh, to finished published books, um, but there are many that are not published. Um, there are actually some that have been published in other works that he never finished. And there's actually a project going on now by uh, the Friends group of our museum, the Friends of the Eric Sloan uh, Museum, to kind of catalog and get a full list of, of everything that Sloan wrote. And it's a project they've been doing for years because just like everyone else, you know, every time you turn around, there's something else coming up. Uh, he was a very pro prolific writer, not only his his books, but uh, hundreds of articles uh, for newspapers, magazines, um, all kinds of things. Interesting. Um, so the, the, the museum collection... Um, and people can't see this right now, but Andrew's coming to us with one of the best backdrops ever in, in preserve cast recording history. He's, he's in clearly in Eric Sloan's shop, um, and the museum, we're going to talk about the museum, what you do and everything like that. But, um, you have a lot of tools. I mean, cause he was, he loved tools, early American tools is one of his books. Um, any sense for how many tools are in the collection? I guess you're the curator. So if anybody knows, you might know. 
Yeah, and I had a really great opportunity. Uh, we just went through renovation, so all the tools had to be pulled out, and we got to put all of them back in. So that was just, you know, awesome. Uh, but we have just under a thousand uh, tools throughout the collection, um, and, and in our exhibit, um, everything ranging from small handmade clothespins all the way up to a horse-drawn or a horse-powered treadmill. Um, uh, we have sleighs. Uh, Anything that is early American tools or trades, um, Sloan has it represented here. So that's uh, it's obviously a lot. He 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 got to collecting, which is is cool, and it'd be interesting to hear how you're going to use that that collection kind of moving forward. Do you have his original sketches? So I mean, the sketches if pre- for people who haven't read these books, and um, we'll put a link maybe um, in the show notes to some some Sloan books and, um, and to your site, but, um, the sketches are a prominent role. I mean, he, he, he writes and he's a, he's a very, um, engaging author. It's easy to read. It's kind of fun to read. Um, but the sketches are just, you know, they're really beautiful. Um, and so I'm curious, where are the original sketches? So we have, uh, many of the original sketches that we've received through donation, uh, not only through, uh, the Sloan estate, but through just collectors of, of Sloan's artwork. Um, he was really great about um, interacting with his, his fans and his audiences and would often give away original pieces. Um, so we have uh, several original sketches from his book, Return to Taos, which is a, a, a reminiscence of his, his early life and a journey uh, to New, New Mexico where he's gonna spend a lot of his life. Um, and then we have uh, some several prints from from sub, or, uh, sketches from his other books. We also have a, a large collection of unpublished sketches, um, doodles. And one thing that I really love about Sloan is a lot of the times when he would uh, sign these books for for fans, um, he would add uh, remarks to the book. So he would add personalized sketches. Uh, along with his well wishes. So we have just a, a really great collection of signed books that have these really interesting, you know, covered bridge sketches or little cartoons that Sloan had done. So um, we're, we're pretty fortunate with the collection we do have. Yeah, I feel like a lot, a lot of my doodles, I'm always trying to sketch like uh, Eric Sloan. I, I don't think I ever get there, but I try. So um, but big, big question. I don't know how you answer this, but what did Sloan get right and what did he get wrong? I mean, we touched on it a little bit, but, and this probably leads into kind of what the future for the museum is. Cause how do you tell this story that, you know, he was somebody prominent that a lot of people bought his books in say the mid 20th century, but awareness of Sloan probably isn't where it was 30 years ago. So what did he get right? What did he get wrong? And what does that mean for the future of the museum? So uh, one thing he, we feel he did get right uh, is that he was able to donate his collection for the good of the public. Uh, in 1969, he partnered with Stanley Toolworks uh, to provide the uh, Stanley Toolworks provided the museum, and Sloan provided the collection, his entire collection of early Americana, and he felt that it would best be used uh, for telling uh, the story not only of the past but helping tell the story of the future. So. Uh, another thing he got right is that idea of preservation, not only for history, um, but also for the environment. Uh, he was a big environmentalist. A lot of his books um, talk about the idea of losing um, these these natural resources, and and as we move forward, they they continue to dwindle. So that that's a large part uh, that we feel he got right of trying to preserve um, history and the environment. So we also feel he was a very talented uh, storyteller and narrator. Um, Oftentimes he's able to just take his audiences along a journey um, into the past. It's it's very enjoyable to read and very easy to follow, especially when it's partnered with his his beautiful uh, pen and ink sketches or or his diagrams that he includes along with his book. Um, He felt that it was important to tell uh, the common story. He, He felt that um, in the 1950s and the 1960s, that there was a lot of writing about uh, what he considered to be the American elite um, of the past and not enough about the, the what he considered to be the common American. Unfortunately, one of the things he gets wrong with that is he's not telling the story of, of all Americans. Uh, when he's talking about his early pioneers and his early settlers, oftentimes um, what he's referring to are white Americans uh, or white settlers. And a lot of times his, his imagery reflects that. 
So that's something that we are um, we acknowledge here, and we are moving forward. Um, Tate, we are uh, Sloan often championed the idea that um, if something's wrong, fix it, and that's that's what we're looking at here. Uh, we want to continue to tell the story of people throughout America, but tell uh, more stories than than what Sloan did, and we think that's something that we're not stepping outside of. Uh, or stepping away from from Sloan's original thoughts on that, um, we are uh, hoping to to tell more diverse stories um, about people and how their their lives were um, in, in early America. So, how does that work? I mean, are you going to use the tools? Are you going to use the space? What's the what's the hope? I know that this is sort of in progress, but what's the hope about um, the future of the museum? So we're really hoping that uh, we can use the tools um, and Sloan's ideals uh, to, to move forward. Um, we, we the, the site here is an incredible resource. Um, we have a lot of different avenues we can we can travel. Um, focusing on the tools, Sloan um, when he put those in there, he he um, wanted to display them. Um, not as the pieces themselves, but as vehicles to tell a story. And that's the same thing that we'll be doing. We'll be talking about um, early Americans, not just early white Americans who would have been using these tools or going through these experiences. Um, we're going to be partnering with uh, tradespeople today, uh, other museums um, that are looking to also tell the story because as you well know, it's it's not something that one person has the right answer to. I think um, looking at Sloan's idea of the importance of community, we're gonna reach out um, and listen and learn and work together with, with other institutions and, and individuals um, to, to try to come up with this answer of how we're going to do this together. Um, because uh, there's, there's not one right way to do it. Um, there's a lot of ways that we want to try to do it. And um, we're, we're excited to begin that process. Yeah. And I think like this moment, there's so many people who are just interested in sort of the authenticity of the past and kind of moving back towards those things. And during this pandemic, like I thought it was interesting that this Christmas season, more people bought real trees than like ever in like the past 50 years. I mean, tree lots, tree farms, everybody's selling out. Because I think that there was sort of like this, okay, maybe we can focus on the real things that matter about Christmas. And, you know, if you're a Christian and that's what you celebrate or, you know, whatever it might be. I just, that's just one example that I kind of is resonating with me at this moment. But um, I think that there's a real interest in that. And you just have such an amazing campus to tell that story. So um, I'll, I'll be interested to follow along and, um, you know, have you back again in, in the next couple of years to, to talk about it. So, um, Maybe we'll move into some specific questions, but we'll do that after we take a break. So let's take a break here. We'll come back. We'll talk about specific objects that you love, Sloan books, how to learn more about the museum, all that good stuff. And we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Hey, it's Nick here. And I want to remind you briefly that your support is what makes this podcast possible. To keep hearing important stories like this one, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and follow along on social media at PreserveCast. You can also continue supporting the podcast with a donation at PreserveCast.org. PreserveCast is sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland, a nonprofit organization that believes we all succeed when we all know more about our past. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast today. We're really excited to be continuing our conversation with Andrew Rowan, who is the uh, acting curator and site administrator at the Eric Sloan Museum. And before we took our break, we talked all about Sloan, the artist, the collector, the historian, the the, the sketcher, the curmudgeon, um, whatever you might uh, like best about Eric Sloan. There's just so much there. And we're talking about how they're using the collection and, and how that matters and how to tell more diverse stories and engage more people um, with a collection and, and a person who is, is unique and um, worth remembering and, and worth using to uh, kind of understand where we're headed. Um, and so before we took the break, I said that we were going to come back and maybe talk about specific things that you like. So um, it doesn't have to be one, but do you have a favorite object or, 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 or one or two that you would want to mention within the collection that you think are just, they sort of resonate with you for some reason or another? Yeah, so uh, that's probably hard to, to narrow down to one. Um, but uh, one of the 
I think the most interesting things we found, um, or I found as we were reinstalling this collection after a couple of years of, of being close to renovations, uh, we were putting the, uh, in our recreation of Eric Sloan's studio, um, after he died in 1985, um, his wife generously donated his studio um, and it was rebuilt here on the museum campus as, as part of our building. And as a part of that studio included uh, the author's library. So everything that, that Sloan was reading and referencing as he's writing his books, and it's just fascinating. There, there are hundreds of books here um, and it just took up a, a large part of our time putting it back because we were you know, just fascinated by everything that was there. And one of the coolest items, uh, one of his books is titled uh, American Barns and Covered Bridges. And when we were putting some of his own works back on the shelf there, he, he has a nice little arrangement of his own works. Um, this book felt different than, than the others. And uh, I opened it up and sure enough, it was a hollowed out book um, that inside he had placed all of his notes, his handwritten notes and news clippings and correspondence um, about covered bridges um, and barns throughout the United States. Um, a part of that book, he provides a survey of, of a list of where you can still find covered barns throughout the United States. So um, I was just fascinated by all this correspondence where he's reaching out to people in, in all of these states and areas and, and asking them to, to get back to him and, and let him know what bridges are there and, you know, finding pictures and references. Um, so to me, that was really, um, I think a large part of our museum, it, it had never really told the story of Sloan the man. Um, it just kind of showed Sloan stuff. Um, so this is something that we were excited that really humanizes Sloan um, and showed the work that he was putting in uh, to writing um, and, and, and the dedication he had to telling uh, what he thought was America's story. Really cool that you're able to find something like that in the collection that people didn't even know existed. Do you have a favorite, I mean, I guess picking a favorite tool in the Sloan collection might be difficult, but is there a favorite object beyond the, this, this kind of neat um, book story? Yeah. Uh, so um, throughout the tool collection, I think um, the, to me, the, the collection is kind of, uh, at least the tool collection is considered to be uh, a, an object itself. Um, the state of Connecticut, uh, we, the museum is, is operated by the Department of Economic and Community Development. And when they were looking at redoing the museum and making renovations, since Sloan himself installed the exhibit in 1969, it is cons and he considered it to, to be a work of art, um, the exhibit has that kind of feel that it's not a bunch of different objects together. It has one feeling to it. So as you progress along, um, every piece was put there by Sloan himself. So as we're putting that back together, um, when we were going through that process this summer, um, it was interesting to think that a lot of those pieces hadn't been removed since Sloan had put them up. Um, so to me, that was just fascinating to go through and, and think that he had put all these pieces for a specific reason there and, and try to look at the story he's trying to tell through these objects, that it's not about one hay rake or, you know, one viewing act. It's about all of it put together um, and how he, he called them uh, spirit, uh, you know, spirits of, of the early American. Um, so it was, it was kind of um, interesting to, to think of it that way uh, rather than seeing them as individual objects. It, yeah, it's, it's it's it it truly is sort of the the collection of the whole, I guess. Um, so, do you um have a favorite Eric Sloan book? Uh, I again, that one's probably a hard one to answer too. Um, as like a lot of people, um, even though I, I work here, finding new things all the time is uh, just fascinating. Um, but I think um, some of the, the classic, probably more well-known Sloan books, uh, like Our Vanishing Landscape, uh, to me is one that I really um, enjoy and find myself reading over again, not only because of its looking at uh, the American past, but um, the story he tells about conservation and environmentalism within, within that book, um, I think really... Um, shows a, a side to Sloan that's beyond the tools and beyond the trades and, and beyond all of the, you know, uh, old timey things he was trying to show. He, it, it showed the importance of, of the environment and, and protecting it. So 
um, to me, that's that's probably one of one of my favorites. Not that anyone's asking, but because I don't really ever have a chance to share my favorite Eric Sloan books, I uh, I like a reverence for wood. And I also like Seasons of America's Past. I feel like Seasons of America's Past is one that I can come back to again and again because it's sort of like, all right, what season are we in now? And what is what does Eric tell us was happening historically during this time? Yeah, it's they're they're uh, they all just have you know wonderful bits of information that you can pull out of them. And like you said, if you work around some of the rougher edges of of his, you know, oftentimes his his curmudgeonness, um, there's some there's some real gems in there. And and for us, it's um, as far as interpretation, it it just opens the door to kind of every possibility out there um, of of the stories we can tell here. Yeah, and I, I find his curmudgeonness endearing, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, so if people want to learn more, they want to visit the museum, um, where can they do that? How can they do that, I guess? So uh, there'll be links in the, the show notes about where you can find us on social media and our, our website. Uh, we're looking at, unfortunately, due to our, uh, our renovations uh, process finishing up and, of course, uh, COVID-19 concerns, we were closed uh, for this year and throughout this winter, uh, but we're hoping to reopen in the spring of uh, 2021 and have a grand, uh, big grand reopening of some sorts um, next summer. And all that information will be uh, both on our Facebook, on the Instagram, and on the uh, the actual museum website. Perfect. Um, and um, what's next uh, for you at the museum? What are you, what's the big projects that you're working on? I mean, obviously reinstalling everything is a big project and reinterpreting everything is a big project. So there's a lot on the horizon. Um, but is there anything specific that, that you're looking forward to? Uh, I think now that we have the collection reinstalled, uh, we have something over well over 2000 items in the collection. So getting that all back together, um, was was kind of the main focus of the summer, but now I'm I'm really excited to to turn my attention to reinterpreting this place, um, and looking at the stories we can tell. Um, Sloan saw this museum as a testament to the early American, um, and the spirit of early America, and we're really looking forward to taking it a step beyond that and showing that there's not just one idea or two ideas that that encompass. Uh, what it means to be an American. There's uh, just a plethora of things that that we can identify with. Um, and we're going to, I'm just excited to see where that takes us. Um, working with um, the humanities throughout Connecticut, um, we're looking at partnering with uh, our sister organizations in the arts um, and just looking to make this museum an active space for the community that people can come and engage with and actually use um, rather than coming here just to kind of see old stuff. Um, so we're, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to that process of making this an, an engaging, mean, meaningful place. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can even imagine like a, uh, an engaging exhibit, like be the curmudgeon where you have to kind of write something cynical. I, I, I like <laughs> something fun like that. Um, or doing some Eric Sloan sketching, you know, having kids out to try and learn how to sketch. I mean, there's just, as you know, I mean, as someone living in this, there's just so many fun opportunities with the work that he did and, and telling those stories. So uh, I'm thrilled that someone like yourself is there and that um, the Sloan story is in good hands. And, and hopefully, as I said, we can come back in a couple of years and um, catch up with you and see um, where, where the museum is then. Um, before we say goodbye, though, um, final question, normally the most difficult for anyone in this field, um, your favorite historic place or site? Oh, man. Yeah, that's probably the toughest one. Um, and I think it changes all the time. Uh, right now, uh, I have really been enjoying going to Old Sturbridge Village uh, and just seeing um, the trades programs there and just seeing all the, the engaging stuff that they're doing. Um, but we uh, moving here uh, during, you know, COVID times um, kind of made that uh, one of the only museums that was was really accessible. So I'm really looking forward to um, exploring everything that the New England area has to offer and uh, all the wonderful museums that, that are up here. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's a good answer, particularly a good answer when uh, it references a previous um, 
uh, somebody previously on the show. So um, you can go back and listen to our previous episode with the CEO of Old Sturbridge Village if you're listening and you want to learn more about that place. Um, Andrew, this has been a lot of fun, just a really great conversation and so glad to hear about the work that you're doing there. Uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity and uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to preservecast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.